The next statistical test that we have to investigate is the independent samples t-test. Just as we've done before, we want to make note of the associated assumptions that go along with the t-test. For these, the data must be continuous. The data must also be normally distributed, and the sample must be randomly formed. Now, let's investigate the overall function and the overall purpose of the independent samples t-test. The purpose of this statistical measure is to compare one continuous and one categorical variable where there are two groups for the categorical variable. Now, for a brief example, let's consider this. Let's imagine that we wanted to compare how males and females do as it relates to the performance on the SAT. In this particular example, males and females would represent gender, and SAT would represent the continuous variable that we're interested in. So to recap, our continuous variable has some kind of numerical value associated with it, and our categorical variable is the variable in which we can place people or things into a certain category. And again, for this particular example, that would be gender. And so we can see here that our categorical variable does indeed have two groups, both male and female. And so here's what we would say. We would say that these two groups are independent of one another, or we could simply say that they are mutually exclusive. And what this means is that technically you can't be in both groups at the same time. We're saying for this, for this example, that you must either be male or female. So let's look at another example here to see how we can apply our use and knowledge of the independent samples t-test. So here's a sample scenario. We would like to determine whether or not there is a difference between males and females as it relates to the number of laps they completed on a 12-minute jogging test. So here we have it. We have the battle of the sexes in terms of competition or a race or what have you. And so what we want to do is we want to identify where is our continuous variable and where is our categorical variable. So if we look in the sample scenario, we can easily identify here that our categorical variable is gender, which again has these two groups, both males and females. And so now that we have our categorical variable, we need to now ask ourselves, well, where is our continuous variable? And you may have already guessed it, it would be the number of laps that the males and females completed on this 12 minute jogging test. So here's what we're looking at. Again, we're comparing males and females. Those are the groups that make up our categorical variable. And our continuous variable here is going to be the average number of laps that both males and females complete. Now, in order for us to utilize the independent samples t-test, we need to use our seven-step hypothesis testing format. So just to review, here are the seven steps. First, we need to state the hypothesis. Second, we'll need to set the alpha level. Third, we'll compute the test statistic. Fourth, we'll determine the degrees of freedom. Our fifth step is to identify the critical value and the rejection region. Our sixth step is to state the statistical conclusion. And lastly, for step seven, we'll state the clinical conclusion. So let's imagine before we get to our sample problem and solving for our independent samples t-test, let's imagine that we have the data here for our 10 participants. So again, we've got 10 participants five are female, and then five are male. So participant IDs, number one through five, represent our females. And we can see exactly how many laps each of these females completed. So participant one completed 16 laps, participant two, 12 laps, 
spent three, 11 laps, and so on. Now, participants numbers six through 10, again, these represent our male participants, and we can again see that participant six completed seven laps, participant seven, eight laps, and again, so on and so forth. So, again, this is the data that we have for this particular scenario. Now, what we're looking at is a table that helps us to identify values or measures of central tendency and variability. Now, what we have listed here, the N represents the number of people in both groups, be it male and female. Of course, we have the mean here. We have something called variance and standard deviation, which we'll talk about here momentarily. And so what we'll want to do is fill in this chart as we know the values that are associated with the things that are bolded. Now, the thing that we know offhand, without a doubt, is that we have five females, and we also know that we have five males. So you can feel free to put this in the chart now, and we'll fill out the remaining data as we come to it. So let's get into some math to help us determine how this independent samples t-test will enable us to determine whether or not there's a difference in how well males and females performed on the given test. So we have a formula here which represents our formula for the standard deviation. And so let's start with this Greek letter symbol here. So if you're in a Greek organization, fraternity, or sorority, you may be familiar with this sign. It is the Greek letter sigma. But what it means for us in math is the sum of. Now, right next to this in our numerator, we have in parentheses x minus x bar. So our x here represents every value in the distribution. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But again, it represents every value in the distribution. Secondly, we have x bar, which represents the mean or the average of the distribution. Now, don't forget that on the outside of this parenthesis, we have the squared symbol as well. Okay. Now, if we move into our denominator here, we know that we have n minus 1 where n, in this particular instance, represents the number of numbers in the distribution. So let's take a look at how this all shapes out. All right, let's look at our formula for the standard deviation for females. Now that we know what each of these letters and symbols represent, let's kind of find our mean or our average first. That'll be the first thing that we need to do to get on the right track. So we saw earlier that each of the females in our study had the recorded number of laps completed. So 16, 12, 11, 15, and 12. Again, we have just simply taken the number of laps that each female completed. If we total those up, we'll see that we have a total of 66 laps. And so, of course, to get the average here, we'll just divide that 66 by 5 because we have 5 females. And so what we'll get is 13.2. So now that we have our average here, what we're going to do is use this average and we're going to subtract our average of 13.2. We're going to subtract it from every number that's in our distribution. So here's what our distribution is. It's actually listed here for us. 16, 12, 11, 15, and 12. This is our distribution because these represent the number of laps completed by each female. So again, we'll subtract 13.2 from every value that we see listed. So here it is. We've done that. And if we do the math, we'll get for each line that we see here, we'll have 2.8, negative 1.2, negative 2.2, 1.8, and then lastly, negative 1.2.
And what we can't forget is that we'll have our squared symbol at the end of our parentheses. So if we do the math here and we total these up, we should get a total of 18.8. Again, we can't forget uh, the denominator here, which is again n minus 1. So remember earlier we said that n represents the number of numbers in our distribution. And so if we're looking at this, we know that we have five females. And so therefore, we have five data points to represent the number of laps completed. So therefore, we'll have 18.8 .8 divided by 4. And this will give us 4.7. Now, we can't forget that we still have our square root symbol here that all of this data is underneath. But before we get there, this 4.7 represents our variance. So we can hold on to this value as well. So again, so far we have the average for our females, which is 13.2, and we have the variance for our females as well, which is 4.7. It is still considered to be under our square root symbol. So we'll take that 4.7, which is our variance, and if we take the square root of that, we will get 2.16, which now becomes our standard deviation. So going back to the chart that we looked at earlier, here's what we can fill out now. Again, we knew that we have five males, and then we knew that we had five females, but now we can add something to the mix here. We know, again, that our mean is 13.2, the variance here is 4.7, and the standard deviation is 2.16. So we've got that, and so now we need to do the exact same thing for the males. So let's go back to the chalkboard here. We're going to list our formula for standard deviation, and again, this is our formula for males. We're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to first start by finding the average number of laps completed for the males. So here it is. 7, 8, 18, 10, and 10. If we total those values up, we will get 53. And of course, to get the average, we'll divide by 5 because we have 5 numbers here. And that will give us an average of 10.6. So just like we've done before, we're going to take this average, 10.6, and we're going to subtract it from every number in our distribution. So let's see what that looks like. We'll take 7 minus 10.6, 8 minus 10.6, 18 minus 10.6, 10 minus 10.6, and 10 minus 10.6 again. So if we do the math here, we should get 3.6, negative 2.6, negative 7.4, negative 0 0.6, and then again, negative 0 0.6. Now, again, we can't forget that we have our squared number at the end of our parentheses. And so if we do the math here again, we should get 75.2 as our value. Now, our denominator is going to be the same as what we looked at before. It is n minus 1. And so, again, we've got five numbers in our distribution. And so what we'll ultimately have is 75.2 divided by 4, which will give us 18.8. Now, as we said before, that value represents our variance. Again, this is just a way for us to say how much our mean or how much our data varies. So remember also, we still have our square root symbol and we don't want to forget that. So what we'll do is we'll take our variance of 18.8, .8, we'll find the square root of it, and we'll get as our standard deviation 4.33. So let's go back to our chart here for a second. We knew offhand that we had five females and five males. 
And just a moment ago, we were able to identify the mean variance in standard deviation for the data that pertains to our female participants. And now we can fill in the data that we have for our male participants. So we know that the mean for our male participants in terms of the number of laps completed is 10.6. The variance was 18.8 .8, and our standard deviation here is 4.33. So here's how we do this. We jump right into our hypothesis testing now. Now for our null hypothesis, here's what we'll say. We'll say that there is no difference between males and females in the number of laps that they completed on a 12 minute jogging test. Again, remember that our null hypothesis doesn't necessarily represent what we think is correct. It's simply there for us to use statistics to help us know whether or not we need to reject that statement or fail to reject that statement. So let's look at our alternative hypothesis now. Again, we have H subscript A is not equal to zero. And here's what it will say. It will say that there is a difference between the number of males and females and the number of laps they completed on a 12 minute jogging test. And we know that 0 0.05 means that we're giving ourselves 95% chance to say that we're confident and that we're accurate about our results, but we're also giving ourselves 5% chance to say that our results occur based on error. So let's look at step three here, which allows us to compute the test statistic. So as you're writing down this formula, let's also make sure that we identify what each of these letters and symbols mean. Now the T represents the test statistic. And if we look in the numerator here, X bar one represents the sample mean for group one and X bar two represents the sample mean for group two. Now under this uh, numerator, we've got our denominator which has our square root symbol, so we don't want to forget about that. But underneath the square root symbol, we have s squared 1. And what this represents is the standard deviation squared for group 1. Next to that, we have in parentheses 1 over n with a subscript 1. Now, the n here with the subscript 1 simply represents the number of people in group one. Next to that, we have S squared two, which again represents the standard deviation squared, but this time it's the standard deviation squared for group two. And then again, we have in parentheses one over N two. And then N two represents the number of people in group two. So, here is our formula, and now that we know exactly what this means and what it represents, we can now begin to plug in the data that we've gathered for this particular scenario. So let's take a look at it. If we plug in our data, we should have t equals 13.2 minus 10.6, and that's all over the square root of 4.7 multiply by 1 over 5 plus 18.8 .8 multiply by 1 over 5. Now you may have noticed while doing this by hand that our standard deviation squared is really just the variance. And so if you wanted to, you could almost skip that step of having to square the standard deviation and simply just record the variance for s squared. Now, if you've got this put in so far, you're on the right track. So let's take a moment and see what this would be broken down into as we do the math here. We would get t equals 2.6 over the square root of 0.94 plus 3.76. Breaking it down further, we would have t equals 2.6 over the square root of 4.7. Having that broken down, of course, we'd have t equals 2.6 over 2.16. And as our final result, we would have t equals 
1.19. So let's look at step four here. Our step four is to determine the degrees of freedom. So here we go. Our formula here is gonna be a little bit different than what we've seen before. Our formula is DF equals N1 plus N2 minus two. So DF of course stands for degrees of freedom. Our N1 here simply represents the number of people in the sample for group one and our N2 also represents the number of people in the sample for group two. And then this is all gonna be minus two. So here's how we put this in. We knew that we had five males and five females. So the way we've got it listed, group one is our females, so we have five there. And then of course, males is our group two, so of course we have five there. So five plus five of course gives us 10, minus two gives us eight. So eight then is our degrees of freedom. So let's take a look now at our critical value of T table. If you have one accessible, please feel free to pull that out. I think it'll be helpful for you to look at it on that table, but I'll provide an example here on the screen so that you can have a reference point. Looking at our critical value of T table, what we want to do is to begin by identifying where our alpha level is. And so we know that ours is gonna be 0 0.05. And so now we're looking for a degree of freedom of eight. And this time we actually have eight as the specific number that we're looking for. And so because eight is listed specifically, we'll just simply line that up with our column that has our alpha level of 0.05. And so that means for us that our critical value will be 2.306. So now that we've got our critical value, what we'll do for step five is to create our graphical representation. So now that we've got our graph, step five asks us to identify the critical value and the rejection region. So our critical value again is 2.306. So we'll put 2.306 on the left-hand side, and we'll denote that as negative. And then we'll put 2.306 on the right-hand side, and we'll denote that as positive. So we know that if our value, if our T value, falls within these two outer regions, we know that we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Now, the space in the middle here represents our fail to reject region. So again, if our value falls within this particular range, we know that we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. So again, we've got to pull back um, and go to what our T value is um, in this particular scenario. And so again, just as a way to remind us, we know that we've got our critical values here, and our T value is 1.19. And so obviously, that would fall right in the middle of our graph. And so this means that it is in the fail to reject region. So now that we've done that, here's what we'll do. We'll go to steps six and seven, and for steps six and seven, we'll summarize what we can say about this particular study. Step six, remember, ask us to make a statistical conclusion. And all that is, is taking what we've just seen in graphical representation and putting that into words. So here's what we'd say for our statistical conclusion. We would say that our observed test statistic falls within the fail to reject region, therefore we fail to reject the null hypothesis. This means that there's no difference between the number of laps completed by males and females. So think about this again. Remember that our null hypothesis says that there is no difference. And so if we fail to reject that statement that there is no difference, essentially we're accepting that statement to be true. And so we can say with confidence that 
This means that there's really no difference between how males and females com competed on this given test. Now, for step seven, we're going to make a clinical conclusion. So here it is. For our clinical conclusion, we would say we do not have statistically significant evidence to show that the number of laps completed between males and females is different. So there we have it. We have now completed our independent sample t-test. If you feel comfortable with what we've done so far, feel free to try the next practice problem. If not, feel free to go back to any portion of this video to make sure that you've got everything lined up the way you need to. Also, please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Thank you.